Halo 5 Guardians, the second entry in the Reclaimer Saga, 343 Industries' second official game, and arguably the most anticipated Halo title in the history of the franchise. Arguably. Halo 3's finish the fight was certainly unforgettable, and the idea of experiencing the fall of the planet Reach, regardless of your opinion of the final product, built quite the memorable levels of hype. Still, the hype around Halo 5 is certainly palpable, and after playing it, I have to say the hype is absolutely deserved. Of course, I have to point out before we get into this, I was given a free copy of Halo 5, so take my praise with a grain of salt. And of course, beware of spoilers ahead. There's nothing too major, no endgame stuff, but don't let it be said you weren't warned. The story of Halo 5 picks up eight months after the end of Spartan Ops in Halo 4. As I'm sure many of you have seen by now, we open with an introduction to Osiris and the basic situation that the galaxy is encountering. Human colonies are getting hit by forerunner attacks of some kind, and Dr. Catherine Halsey, former head of the Spartan 2 program, has reached out to the UNSC claiming to have vital knowledge on the nature and source of the attacks. From there, Osiris is deployed and goes to work. Immediately, players are thrown into the fray as Covenant and Promethean forces are suddenly fighting each other. Quite the surprise for many considering that, last we saw, the two forces were still allied. Julum Dama is the Didax Hand, after all. A major criticism in Halo 4 was the sudden inclusion of lore and characters from the Expanded Universe without proper context, and believe me, there were criticisms both from fans of the Expanded lore and those who had only played the games prior to that. 343 has certainly learned from that mistake with Halo 5. Through the game, characters will start talking about minor and major plot elements, providing context for fans willing to listen in. A great example of this is during the opening level, when Olympia Vale picks up a transmission in Sanghili. While the transmission plays, Vale translates. Holly Tanaka then inquires how Vale knows Sanghili, and she explains. How'd you learn to speak Sanghili, Vale? When I was a kid, I was stuck on a diplomatic shuttle adrift in deep space for six months. My options will be real bored or spend the time getting smart. Sadly, not every important detail is revealed, such as the sudden appearance of more Spartan 2s. Still, 343 certainly went above and beyond to make sure players have the opportunity to learn about the world they've entered and done so in a way that really feels natural. It's funny what can suddenly pop up in conversation if you stand around long enough. After Osiris recovers the Doctor, we're introduced to Blue Team, led by John 117, the hero of the franchise, the Master Chief himself. The loss of Cortana is certainly felt in this opening cutscene, as is the sense of brotherhood and camaraderie among the Spartan 2s. Of course, I'm very familiar with their history, so perhaps I'm projecting. Anyway, Blue Team's mission is to infiltrate an Oni base called Argent Moon. Lost two years prior, the station has since been taken over by Covenant forces. Blue Team enters in a manner that demonstrates the contrast between Spartan 2s and Spartan 4s. Granted, they're not doing a halo drop, no pun intended, onto a mountain into a Covenant army, but the difference in attitude between the twos and fours is wonderfully demonstrated. And as we know, after a few encounters, the Chief is attacked by a hunter and suddenly finds himself in a large cavern, unable to contact Blue Team. Instead, he seemingly finds Cortana. She wards him that Meridian is next, and he only has three days. Of course, this all appears to be just in his head. The Chief is suddenly back on Argent Moon, surrounded by his fellow Spartans. When he mentions his vision, Blue Team, while skeptical, seems open to hearing the Chief out, a credit to their history together. And as a credit to the Chief, he decides that finishing the mission takes priority. As the mission progresses, Blue Team are forced to destroy Argent Moon in an act of asset denial. As the Spartans prepare to leave, Chief contacts the UNSC Infinity to inform them of his potential contact with Cortana. To the surprise of both the players and Blue Team, Infinity is aware of Cortana's presence on Meridian and orders Blue Team to return to Infinity, noting that another Spartan team is being prepped to deal with her. From there, I think most people get the general idea of where the story goes. Blue Team goes AWOL and Osiris is sent after them to bring them in and discover what made them leave in the first place. The game is an absolute blast overall. The new verticality and accompanying mechanics make for very diverse encounters. Combined with a plethora of open combat spaces and persistent presence of your fellow Spartans, the game never gets old. The Spartan AI is some of the best friendly AI in Halo's history. Not the best, but definitely up there. On lower difficulties, they can be very useful in distracting tougher enemies, moving up while you flank, and generally allowing the player to engage enemies in more diverse ways. However, these AI are by no means a crutch. They take damage, they can die, and on Legendary, if you go down, it's unlikely they'll be able to revive you before dying themselves. Enemy AI are as engaging as ever and show that 343 has not only learned from the mistakes of the past, be those their own or Bungie's, but have gone above and beyond to make encounters engaging, fun, and most of all, fair. Enemies are still buffed on higher difficulties, but are no longer the bullet sponges fans have been complaining about since, at least, Halo Reach. Hunters are now the mini-bosses I'm sure they were always intended to be. It's not as simple to access their weak point, 
They charge faster to account for new player abilities. They can deflect grenades, and they have two firing modes, the classic fuel rod blast and a minigun mode. All this makes the hunters truly formidable and all the more satisfying to take down. Other enemies have had their own rebalancing, such as jackals being able to hit back if you rush in to melee them, and the Promethean class of enemy has received a huge overhaul. Crawlers themselves have largely gone unchanged, still acting as the Promethean grunt, easy to kill but a threat in great numbers. Watchers too retain their support role from Halo 4, but both classes felt far less annoying than in Halo 4. The Knights have received some major changes, now acting as mini-bosses with sweet spots you have to shoot to remove armor, exposing the core to allow you to kill them, either from direct fire or assassination. Be warned, however, as Watchers can regenerate that armor if given the chance. Finally, we have the Soldiers. I've made no secret about my skepticism on the Soldiers, but engaging them myself was a whole different experience. They take on a role somewhere between the Elites and Jackals, tough enemies, but not too frustrating. Their worst habit is, of course, their penance to teleport around, but thankfully it is predictable and the fact that they use armor now rather than shields means that missing a crucial shot won't entirely screw you over. The only major downside to the Prometheans in Halo 5 was a lack of explanation regarding new and changed classes. The new knights are briefly mentioned as having been observed on Oban, a colony we visited in Halo Escalation, but the origins of the soldiers go completely unmentioned. One can certainly guess at the in-universe origins of these changes and additions, but no explanations beyond what I presented here are apparent, near as I can tell. Skull and Terminal Hunting have both become staples of the franchise, and both return in Halo 5 in some manner. Skulls are hidden throughout certain levels a la Halo 2 or 3, some just off the beaten path, others in the form of easter eggs. The real treat for lore fans, however, is the intel. In place of the terminals fans have come to love, 343 have implemented intel items. While the lack of visual content may be a turnoff for some, the 117 intel items allow for much more and varied stories, from hilarious treats such as a grunt's personal diary, to the logs that present background for a mission or hints at the larger story. Those are certainly worth the search. Overall, Halo 5 is an improvement unprecedented in the franchise. The story is one of, if not the grandest and most sweeping ever told in the games. Some fans may not enjoy certain aspects, such as the large amount of time you spend with Osiris, but I found that it makes the segments with Blue Team all the sweeter. It's said that nothing will be the same after Halo 5's story, and I can't help but agree. After careful consideration, I found that I absolutely have to give Halo 5 a 9 out of 10. Of course, this is just my more than likely biased opinion. Play the game yourself, or if you're skeptical, watch a playthrough first. Thanks for joining me for this spoiler light review. I'll have a much more in-depth look at the story in the weeks to come, just as soon as I track down all those pesky intel items. They really are well hidden. Until next time, this has been Halo Cannon, and may you all shine brighter than ever. Hey guys, thanks for watching. If you liked this video, please consider giving it a thumbs up, subscribing, and sharing it around. You are the reason I get to keep doing this, so thank you profusely thank you. If you want to dive deeper into Halo's lore, head over to the Halo Archive. It's a lore-based community that welcomes everyone from experts to rookies. No matter what your working knowledge, you'll be sure to find a friend and a good time.